social uh, inequities. Um, the pandemic has been stressing our, our abilities to cope uh, and has been freeing up uh, supply chains. And some people have said that, you know, the pandemic is a uh, trial run of the impacts that we're likely to see um, from climate change or that it uh, or that the pandemic is climate change at, at warp speed. But uh, a silver lining, if there is any uh, to, to be had uh, from this experience, is that hopefully some of the habits that we are now forming, like teleworking or uh, walking more, or greater appreciation for nature, can become part of the new normal uh, after the pandemic. And we've also learned that human health has a broad resonance. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to rebuild and recover from the pandemic with climate action resilience and uh, racial equity in mind. Something else that the um, uh, pandemic gave that I would like to kind of put in the, um, uh, on the side of, an of being an opportunity is um, because we were, we were not able to interact uh, with residents um, physically, you know, uh, uh, face to face, uh, it really highlighted to us um, how even more important it is for us to engage with the uh, vulnerable members of our community, the frontline um, communities that were not very well represented in our work group process. Uh, and so our climate planning team um, has been engaging with others and having some very intentional conversations about how do we do that, even though now it's even more difficult than ever to engage uh, with, um, with those members of our community. How do we do that despite the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and so we have um, some ideas that we're um, gonna be kind of putting in place um, starting this summer. Um, the first of which is um, a resilience ambassador pilot. We're gonna be working with youth, high school and, and um, college students over the summer uh, uh, who are uh, members of those communities and they will be helping um, to uh, issue uh, what we are calling a resilience survey uh, some open-ended, um, to have some open-ended kind of conversations um, and ask some kind of broad questions so that we can begin to um, hear um, the, the concerns and the ideas and the challenges um, from these communities and so that we can embed their stories uh, and their priorities into our planning process. Um, we're also looking to build um, a racial equity and social justice um, advisory group um, potentially um, compensating members for participating in that group. Uh, we still have a lot to figure out before we're kind of able to launch it, um, but it's something that we're excited about doing, not only to help inform uh, the plan development, but also to keep in place um, through the plan implementation um, timeframe. So in terms of near, near term actions, you know, we're Definitely not um, standing still while we are planning. Our motto is to act while we plan. Uh, and so with that in mind, um, we recently uh, released uh, the fiscal year 21 uh, work plan of climate actions that's available uh, on our website uh, that's linked here. Uh, it's a list of 38 um, county government actions um, related to um, buildings, transportation, adaptation, carbon sequestration, public engagement, um, um, capacity building and more. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at uh, what we have in the lineup. And one of those 38 actions uh, is to develop uh, state level legislative and uh, regulatory options for greening uh, the county's electricity supply. Uh, we know that greening the county's electricity supply is gonna be an important part of our climate strategy uh, and so this summer, um, we, um, we have uh, a lot of work that we've cut out for ourselves to uh, uh, review the ideas that were generated by the climate work groups, um, particularly uh, by the uh, clean energy work group um, in terms of ideas that were um, relevant to state level um, uh, you know, legislative policies. Uh, we will also be researching some additional promising ideas um, and we will begin some cross-county conversations and coalition building uh, around clean energy policies. Uh, and that's going to be facilitated by MACO, the Maryland Association of Counties. Uh, and, and while we're doing all of that, uh, we need to acknowledge that we're going to need to be um, strategic and to take a multi-year approach uh, to all of this. Let me just kind of delve into each of these bullets um, a little bit more in depth. Um, 
so in terms of the, the work group recommendations that came out um, uh, from the, the clean energy work group, um, their ideas included um, increasing the renewable portfolio standard to 100%, um, modifying or expanding tier one requirements for renewable sources under the RPS, uh, community choice aggregation or community choice energy, a carbon pricing mechanism, and uh, modifying the net metering law. Um, and then in terms of some additional promising ideas that, that we are um, interested in um, exploring, um, it includes um, uh, some procurement tools, um, such as whether we would be able to have a utility purchase some amount of renewable, renewable energy on behalf of the county. Uh, for example, um, one tool that was just uh, put in place in DC um, by a public service commission order there um, requires their local um, electric, electricity uh, or electric utility to um, increase um, the amount of renewables that is part of their standard offer service um, by mandating that 5% um, of the standard offer service um, be conducted through a long-term uh, PPA. Uh, another idea that we are interested in exploring are still kind of the very kind of early stages of looking into is uh, related to Empower Maryland. So that, you know, that is, um, there is a utility surcharge that we all pay um, and it goes uh, to the utilities to implement um, energy efficiency programs. Um, and we are interested to see whether there's any feasibility of having some of those funds go directly to the, to the jurisdictions um, rather than to the utilities. Um, to give us more um, opportunity to uh, do some local programming of those funds. Um, I'm really excited about the, you know, the potential to have these uh, conversations with uh, other counties uh, on uh, clean energy policies um, uh, and, and looking forward to, you know, this facilitated conversation that MAKOU is going to be organizing for counties uh, this summer. Um, I had some preliminary um, conversations with a couple of counterparts a couple months ago and, and um, everybody that I talked to was, was really looking forward to this opportunity to, um, you know, kind of see where we may have um, areas of overlapping interest. Um, because I think that if we are able to build those coalitions, it's going to give us, um, you know, greater likelihood that whatever we are jointly supporting is going to, you know, pass, um, you know, um, at, at the General Assembly. Um, so I think that pretty much concludes my remarks. I do have one last slide, which gives you some um, suggestions for how to stay involved uh, with the county uh, on both climate planning and climate action. Uh, again, I encourage you to take a look and comment on the 850 uh, work group recommendations. You can, subs you can subscribe to the Montgomery County Climate Newsletter um, by going to our webpage. Uh, we try to Put, put out the newsletter about once a month. Our June issue just went out yesterday. Um, starting in June, on June 18th, we're gonna be launching what we're calling um, monthly virtual office hours with the climate planning team. Um, so these are available to open to anybody in the community that wants to touch base with us and just ask any question, offer suggestions. Um, uh, we'll be there um, every month um, and, and, and that schedule is, is up on, on, our, on our website as well. And then um, you can look forward to you know, reviewing, providing feedback on the dra draft uh, CARP uh, when it comes out um, in November. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Adriana. Very, very comprehensive. I think what we're gonna do is, um, for the most part, we're gonna save the, the questions for, for both our, our speakers until after Laura goes. But I did wanna just ask you, um, Adriana, uh, well, two things, one, one um, will it, the slide deck be available to us, please, to, to sure. share? That'd be Absolutely. awesome. Great. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, in, in my opinion, who, you and your colleagues chose uh, an excellent uh, consulting firm team. Uh, could you just talk about who, who was chosen and, and what they're bringing to the table for the, for the county, please? Sure. Um, so the, the winning team um, who is working on our plan is um, a AECOM, uh, which is a large consulting firm, and they have partnered with Inspire Green, uh, which is a small firm based in DC. Um, so AECOM, even though they're headquartered in California, they have a Germantown office, and their Germantown office is the one that is leading uh, the effort. Uh, Inspire Green um, has uh, experience and focus on um, public engagement, racial equity work, 
they have previously worked with the county on the um, equity framework for the Vision Zero plan. Um, and AECOM has experience in developing climate action plans for uh, a number of different cities and jurisdictions, both uh, nationally and internationally. And, and I believe AECOM was uh, right the uh, number one uh, sustainability consulting firm in, in 2019. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's on their website. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, I really like the, the combination of the technical uh, strength and the, the community uh, engagement and, and uh, inclusivity. So let's um, now, if, if we could uh, turn it over to, to Lorig. Um, Laura, you, you heard uh, Adriana and she talked about uh, the interface with the state and I know um, the county and, and state have been working together and uh, hopefully we can um, get the community behind uh, and, and, and pushing for, for some things that will be uh, an integrated initiative on the state level or initiatives perhaps. So go ahead, Laura. So, hello everyone. Good evening. It's um, it's good to see many of your smiling faces and other people's smiling names. I <laughs> can't see your faces. I have to say that um, uh, you know, one of the things there's there's many things that have been challenging, but I think that one of the beautiful things about movements is um, is the community building and the relationship building. And I think that. Um, you know, folks have done a remarkable job of, of trying to shift things to um, online platforms, but I will, um, I know we all really miss being able to be together in person and um, look forward to, to when that happens on a more regular basis. And I so just want to thank many of you also not only um, are active here in Montgomery County, but many of you spent a lot of time in Annapolis this past session and, and over the last several years. And so thank you for all of your ongoing advocacy. Um, I think I just want to highlight a couple of things and it's been sort of said, uh, David and, and Adriana, um, uh, I think that, you know, we're going to talk about a number of areas, uh, this point about COVID being sort of the practice for and the lessons that we learn from it in terms of climate change, the realities of what it is that happens when we don't listen to science and when we don't prepare. Um, but it's going to be nothing, as everyone here knows, it's going to be nothing compared to the realities of climate change if we don't make these really significant changes really quickly. Um, and then I think also I would just say that I think our current uprising, the current uprising that we're seeing in this country, um, while the focus and the sort of launching point has been about police abuse and the criminal justice system, the reality is it's about the inequities and the systemic racism that's inherent in, in all of our systems and inherent in the way that um, uh, white folks and communities of color experience uh, the inequities in health uh, disparities and also in climate impacts. Um, and so I think it's really important. I think that uh, as we're going forward, I'm really pleased that see the county's work really grounded in equity. Um, I always try to look at, uh, there's been over the years, some of us have tried to get the state's um, analyses of bills to look at equity issues and to look at climate issues. Um, of course they don't, but, um, but uh, you know, I try to look at every bill that we're considering in those two lenses. Um, and then I also just think I would continue to encourage the organizing that Tacoma Park uh, mobilization has been doing and the partnership building. Um, and in particular, really looking at making sure that frontline communities are participating in the conversation and have a leadership voice um, and a leadership role in the conversation. Um, so with that in mind, I want to touch on, um, on a couple of things and I've sort of been tracking some of the questions. I'll try to incorporate some of the questions that have come in. I think that uh, one of the pieces that we talk about, you know, we talk about how do we get to 100% clean energy. And so I'll kind of break it down from that point. Um, I think everyone's aware that sort of the first step is efficiency and conservation. And so with that in mind, I'll start by talking about Empower and the Low Income Energy Efficiency Bill that I had this year and that um, Adriana and uh, Adam and their staff and I have, have started talking about what, what might we do with that as the county, what, how could the county sort of really build, build in with that. Um, so people may be aware that Empower is the surcharge on your electricity bill. 
Um, we've done a decent job as a state. We actually have, have some of the better numbers across the state compared to the rest of the country in terms of uh, meeting this goal of 2% energy efficiency gains every year. But those gains have really been distributed in a relatively inequitable way. And so those gains are sort of our averages across the board. But then when you look at low income households, the gains across the board last year was 0.04%. So again, you have one of these examples where not only are low income households not only do they have a higher energy burden, and not only are they likely to be in communities that are frontline communities and more impacted by um, climate change, but as it turns out, the way that we're investing this uh, surcharge that everybody's paying into, um, it's being invested in a way that is uh, inequitable. And so I had a bill this year to set a standard for um, how much goes towards the energy, uh, low income energy efficiency, and then to put additional funds into, into that, into that uh, low income energy efficiency. I'll just mention that one of the challenges is worth folks knowing, one of the challenges with, with households, low income energy efficiency um, and weatherization in low income households is that the housing stock tends to be um, of poor quality. And so you're more likely to have health and safety issues, mold and so on. And so what happens is that you can't insulate a house, you can't weatherize and insulate a house that has mold in it, right? It makes the, it makes the air quality even worse, right? Because now you're keeping the, the mold uh, spores inside even more so. And so you have to address the health and safety issues as well. So it ends up just being more expensive, um, but also a really good investment, not only in energy efficiency, but also in this case in, in health health. Um, and so um, what our bill did was it, it took um, money that the state has um, had um, just kind of backs up a little bit, but in case anyone's not horrified enough right this moment, let me just give you one other thing to be horrified about. When the Alta Gas Washington gas merger occurred, um, the states, uh, the county went and asked, you know, when these mergers happen, you go and, you know, you oppose them. And then if you can't oppose them and stop them, then you ask for something good for the community. So the county went and asked for money for, for, um, for energy efficiency and money. I think the county got, got a commitment to get some solar built in the county from Washington Gas. The state went and asked for $30 million, a grant fund that would be used to expand the natural gas infrastructure in the state. And the PSC approved that. So right now there's a $30 million grant fund that came out of the Washington Gas Alta Gas merger that is funding the, the um, natural gas expansion in the state. Um, and I won't go too far into there are pipelines that are being built right now. There's active natural gas expansion right now happening with the support of the Hogan administration. If folks aren't familiar with that, we could do another panel on it later, but it's, uh, it's something that several of us have been fighting. But what we did with this bill is we tried to move that money out of natural gas expansion and into low income energy efficiency. So we were bringing more money into um, efficiency, which is the first step towards 100% clean energy. Um, and in, in, this, in this equitable way. So uh, that's a lot of details, but I just am, I'm highlighting it because I feel like it is the kind of bill that we all need to really get behind because it gets it at multiple, multiple aspects of this issue at once. The bill didn't pass primarily because we ran out of time. I think everybody knows that we ran out of time. Um, we ended session early. Um, but we will uh, bring it back next year. And I'm really intrigued by some of the ideas that the county has and really looking at coordinating um, with the county. Now, what we did do is um, we did manage to take the $5.6 million that the MEA intended, uh, that's the Maryland Energy Administration intended to spend this year out of the 30 million. We took the 5.6 million that was budgeted for this year in the budget and we fenced it off and moved it in the budget to low income energy efficiency. Um, so we at least got that money moved. Now the governor, there will be some advocacy necessary on that because the governor could just um, leave it fenced off and not spend it. And when, when the General Assembly moves money, the governor can choose to spend it or not. He can't spend it on natural gas expansion, but he could choose also not to spend it on low income energy efficiency. So we could talk about advocacy on that at some point. Um, so that's a, that's a lot on that very specific topic, but it is the first step to getting to 100% clean energy. The second thing is really to look at what's, what do we count as 100% clean energy? Um, and so I think you see across the country a lot of efforts towards this 100% and there's states that have certainly gotten to 100% before us and some of them are really good 100% and some of them are kind of messy, sort of, you know, 100%, I'll put it in quotes, kind of like the governor's 100% bill. And if you look even at our RPS, it includes things like black liquor, it includes things like trash incineration, which are not clean energy. 
And so, um, so there's a value to getting to that number 100%, but there's sort of an equal value to cleaning up what we do count. Because if we got to 100% with a lot of it being black liquor and, um, and incineration, it really doesn't get us towards that goal. So I think right now, a lot of us are focused on, um, on cleaning up the RPS. And I think it's worth, um, I think I would say just coming back to this county state nexus, um, I was really pleased that the county took a position in favor of removing incineration from the, the renewable energy uh, portfolio. The county in 2010, actually, I think it was 2010 or 11, took the position to add it to the portfolio. So this county has made that shift thanks to current leadership now fighting against counting incineration as clean energy, even though the county is the one who receives the money from selling the RECs um associated with uh, the incinerator in the county so i really appreciate the county's leadership on that point and i think it is something that um the county could continue to play a leadership role in um baltimore is the other uh place in the state that has an incinerator and uh and i would just say that the baltimore elected officials have been those who have been fighting really hard to keep it into the RPS. So um, that's an interesting place to do some work of coalition building. I think if the county worked with Baltimore City, and I'm hoping that Baltimore City has new leadership also after this election, um, it may be a local leadership, it may be possible really to, um, to, to start cleaning up that, that part of the RPS. Um, I know many of you spent time working on community choice energy, so let me talk a little bit about that. I do think when the county looks at procurement, um, the thing about community choice energy that is uh, most powerful is the, the fact that it's a chance to really control what energy is purchased on behalf of residents in this county. And so it allows for equity considerations, it allows for the type of energy, it allows for the type of energy development, it allows for investments in energy efficiency, it allows for things like demand response and paying people to not use energy at certain times of the day. So there's a lot of really creative things that can be done in the context of a CCE. Um, and I think the way that we know that it is really powerful and that it's a huge shift in the democratization of energy is how hard the utilities fought us. I think that it was remarkable to see, it was like a number one priority for them to kill this bill because what it represented was moving the control of energy decisions out of corporate hands and into the hands of the people through elected representatives at the county and local level. And I think that the level of, of fight that we had um, and their fear of the idea that um, the county could own generation, could own, own battery storage, the, the ideas about storage to grid that the county was talking about, all of that was terrifying um, because it really represented this, this shift in, in this question about who's controlling our energy choices. Um, folks probably know we made a lot of compromises that I have to tell you were very painful to make, um, but made them uh, because we thought we could at least um, move uh, the needle on this. And um, I am so sorry to do this. I don't have a plug and I have to get the plug for my computer. I thought it was right here. Um, someone else could probably pick up the CCE conversation for 30 seconds while I grab it. Yeah, while well, 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 Laura is, is, is doing that, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that uh, a number of us attended the hearing and um, in, in the House Committee that Laura was on. And yeah, it was, it was uh, packed uh, not only with us, with our uh, blue shirts, but lots of uh, corporate suits as well. And uh, um, many of the uh, um, corporate uh, suits were had uh, words that were spoken by uh, Loring's fellow members of the committee and I'm not just talking about the Republicans unfortunately. And yeah, I'd like so. to encourage people to put their questions in the chat. What's yeah, that? Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. would like thank put questions in the chat. Um, Lori is uh, um, collecting them and then when Laura is concluded then we will uh, um, ask the questions to uh, um, both Adriana and Lorg. So, so go ahead, Lorg. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to try to wrap up in just a couple minutes. Um, so I think, but I think that's a really, a really important piece of this conversation is, and again, I think that the uprising that we're looking at that's raising ac across this country that's raising these questions, the way that we watch the the bailout at the federal level um, 
and how much money sort of went to large corporations as opposed to small businesses and real people. Um, and I think that there is this question about like, as we're building this clean energy future, how are we doing it as much as possible with this sort of decentralized, community owned, community controlled, um, and that can't be all of it, but that's got to be a really healthy mix of it. And, um, and that's going to be, I think, the hardest stuff when, you're, when you start talking about the shift in, in control away from shareholders and towards the people. Um, I think some of the issues related to that, um, there's some, some questions about net metering. Um, specifically, community solar. Community solar is a really important part of democratizing um, who has access to solar, who benefits from solar. Um, and getting more and more solar energy out there. And I know that one of the things that the county is looking at that I'm, I'm talking to them about possibly supporting in terms of legislation is increasing the uh, cap on net metering. Um, this is assuming that we can su successfully fight the FERC uh, filing now that is potentially trying to derail our ability to do net metering, but assuming that we can do that, um, if we can increase the cap, it can increase uh, quite a bit the amount of, um, uh, not only distributed energy on rooftops, but also the amount of community solar. That's a really important piece of this, of this puzzle. Um, and I think the last thing that I'll mention, uh, well, two last things I'll mention um, that I also think is, is tied, to, tied to equity, tied, tied to a green recovery, and also tied to really thinking about workers who are left behind or who need to be embraced in the process of the transition. I think folks know that uh, we're hoping to phase out coal because of its incredible damage on the environment, but there's a lot of jobs that appear to be good jobs in the in the coal industry, and I say appear to be because, of course, there's health implications for the people working in those those uh, industries, and there's also health implications for the communities that they live in. Um, but um, but we really the 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 challenge as we're looking at how do we phase out coal as quickly as possible is how do we find really good jobs, well-paying jobs. Um, for the folks. And we, we had a bill this year that was related to that issue um, and, and building a transition plan and it failed. Um, but people probably know that the Dickerson plants have announced that they're closing, which is um, really good news, except there's a bunch of people who now are going to be out of jobs. And so I think it's really important that those of us who are fighting really hard to close these plants are also fighting really hard for those folks who are out of jobs to have uh, to have really good jobs and to work with the unions to make sure that um, that transition is is uh, is just and that there's good union jobs that come out of that um, that transition. And the last thing I want to mention is I, there's a number of people, I think probably some people who are on this call, uh, but there's a number of us who are working on figuring out what a green recovery looks like. So we know that there's going to have to be some kind of a recovery plan. Um, there may or may not be money that actually comes from the federal government that has the term green in it or clean energy in it. But the question is, how can we here in Maryland be ready with a plan that however the money comes from the federal government, whether it has, it's directed towards green energy or not, um, that we're really clear about how that could be spent and what we could do with very little money, what we could do with a little more, what we could do with even a little bit more um, to invest it in ways that um, give us uh, the, the, the three areas we're looking at our efficiency, uh, energy efficiency with a, with a focus on low income uh, households, um, you know, development of um, solar and wind um, and other uh, real clean energy sources and um, uh, transportation is the other area. So there's a, there's a coalition being built to put together that plan so that that plan is sort of ready to go as soon as the state's ready to have the conversations both initially now at a regulatory level with the agencies and then eventually in January. I mean, if, if we have a special session in the special session and if not in January um, when we have our, our, our full session. And I'll stop there and I'll, um, I'll take questions as people have them. Well, great. Thank, thank you very much, Laurie. And, and one of the things that I, I really, I think we all really appreciate is how you both and in, in your, not only in your words, but in your work have really tied together the issues of uh, climate and justice. And uh, as, as we know, so often uh, those of us who are working on, on climate change are uh, um, not as uh, representative of the, the whole um, population, the demographic of whether it's our community or the state. And so um, I think, you know, we, we need to continue to, to not only think about these connections, but to 
really show how how we're we're really solving uh, multiple uh, um, challenges with, with the same activity. So um, let let me start. There are several questions that have come in. So um, let let's start, Laura, with the the money. And and Adriana, please jump in on this as well, as it ties in with the county. But the money in the budget for the low income energy efficiency. I mean, it's it's sort of a brilliant case of, uh, as I say in my business, saving two birds with one act um, by uh, um, moving money from natural gas development to low income energy efficiency. So you said that there there's probably a need for advocacy. Um, what should we be doing uh, given that we're advo advocates and activists? Yeah, good. We, we call it, we do feeding two birds in one hand. Yeah, um, that works like too. That. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I think that uh, it's, you know, you could start and I, I would say you want to work with folks across the state always. I think that the, um, what's the group, the Legislative Coalition, Maryland Legislative Coalition, they've been very effective. Um, it just start writing to the governor and saying, um, you want to make sure that you release those funds that are, uh, that are there for, for, um, energy efficiency. I mean, it's, it is a governor's decision. And um, I think, you know, I could work with who I, uh, I'm trying to think of who's um, working on that. I actually was, well, just tying it back to the county for a second. I actually was just talking to Tom Hucker about it yesterday. And he was talking about possibly um, doing a letter from the county council. Um, so, so that may be a, a county connection. Um, but I think that uh, I could work with somebody to make sure that whoever on TV Mac uh, is the right person um, to make sure that you have sort of the budget language as it's written and then you can use that uh, to just start putting together a, a letter writing campaign or phone calls to the governor's office. Okay, yeah, because certainly, I mean, the first step is to um, let uh, the governor and his people know that uh, we're watching. Yeah, exactly. And now's a good time to do that. I mean, he can release it any time over the course of next year. I mean, it, mm -hmm. he can choose not to release it, and then he could release it in October if he wanted to. Mm. Um, but it's it's never too early to tell him that you're watching. And and I guess Adriana, that maybe ties into the the question in terms of how the the county. Um, what are your constraints and abilities in terms of getting involved in the state issues and uh, the, the, but the priority setting process and then how something like this that uh, was not on a legislative priority list of the council, but how that, how the county can be involved in that. Sure. So um, on this letter specifically about the, the 5 million with MEA, um, I think that um, we can certainly coordinate with council and have it, you know, you know, assuming that the county executive is on board, um, but um, I think we can uh, assume that. Yes. Be, yeah, we can, think we can assume <laughs> that uh, and it could be a joint letter uh, from, you know, from the executive and council on, on that. Um, and then uh, more broadly in terms of legislative, um, the legislative setting process, um, you know, there is the, the annual uh, county priority process. Um, I have a, 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 a cheat sheet here in front of me um, that tells me that, uh, because I'm still fairly new to this process myself, um, but that it's uh, in mid-November uh, when um, the county executive and the county council present the county priorities uh, to the state delegation. Uh, and kind of taking a step back from that, um, it's in um, late October timeframe uh, when our office, uh, the county's office of um, intergovernmental relation drafts uh, the priority uh, list uh, memo uh, and meets with the county executive and gets approval uh, on that work. So then everything kind of backing up to that is the, you know, the, the planning process and the drafting process to get us to um, that, um, that memo um, in the fall. Um, I think my colleague, uh, Amy uh, Saman from the office of intergovernmental relations was on the call earlier. So if you have any any hard questions about that process that she can help answer. Well, let me, let me um, Amy, if, if you're still on, and I, I think you are, I saw your name yeah. briefly, but um, I know last year with CCE, we, we ran into a little bit of a, uh, um, an issue in terms of how something that was not an actual 
bill became a county priority and then how once it was a priority um, what the the process of communicating to the legislature was so we could and some of us are and i apologize i know some of us are really in the weeds and others are, are not so for those who are not in the weeds maybe you can just kind of give us a, a, a general answer please amy sure. so um as adriana mentioned the um the legislative priorities um are presented in november um and it's, it's typically a fairly short list um and that was set by the executive and the council jointly um, and this year um, for uh, 2020 session they chose um, two religious school funding school construction funding and, and operational funding um, and uh, transportation initiatives and they just kept it very high level going into this session so that's you know essentially why and how that came about those those were uh joint, like i said a joint decision between the, the council and the county executive um in years past we've had longer lists and potentially going forward it may change as well but that's just how it shook out this year um there were a lot, a lot of pieces of legislation where the county took um, a forward-facing role uh cce being one of them um adam i think is on the call as well um and um he assisted with that the county executive came down and um testified on it as well as he did last year um and um and then of course we had other ones like uh the bad bill where we got very involved but that of course was not on a priority list it just naturally evolved into something where we took a forward facing role so that does happen from time to time where something is not on it actually happens fairly often where something is not on the high 10,000 foot level priority list, but does take um, a forward facing role and, um, and the county gets very involved in it. I, sorry, is it worrying me? Yeah, I would just, I just would add to it. Just, I think that as activists, the question that you're asking, I'm just gonna be really blunt in my answer to your question. <laughs> If you want an energy policy and a climate energy policy to be a priority for the county, you should be advocating with the county right now for that to happen. Because last year what happened is that there were four, four priorities, um, one of which I think was transportation, which, which is connected to climate, of course. But um, there were no energy policies that were priorities. And so, um, you know, the county executive and, and county staff um, uh, and county, um, uh, legislative staff uh, came and testified in favor of bills, but that's very different than having it as a priority. It's very different than than communicating very clearly to the leadership of the delegations that the expectation is that they will push forward these pieces of legislation. And so what actually happened by the time CCE got into the um, uh, got into the Senate, um, the uh, the leadership of the Senate delegation heard from PEPCO against it before he knew that it was, uh, that the county wanted it, right? So, um, so I think that, um, and that's not, that's not a criticism of anyone in particular, except that's just the reality of the county has its priorities that get communicated to leadership, that being right now Craig Zucker in the Senate and Mark Corman in the House, and then it's their job to really push the delegations and to push in their negotiations with leadership with the, the House and Senate leadership to make sure those bills get through. And so CCE was not one of those bills. So while the, while the county did, did testify in favor of it, it wasn't a priority bill. And so it didn't have that kind of energy behind it. So that's fine. I mean, I think the county needs to make the decision of what its priorities are. And the county may or may not want to go forward with a community choice energy um, program. And, and that's okay too. Um, but if the, if the TPMEC and if, advocates in the county want to make sure that the county has energy as a top priority where it's putting all of its efforts into it in the General Assembly, now is a really good time to be talking to county leadership to say whatever, it's CC or something else, I, but you know, low-income energy efficiency, whatever it is, like mm -hmm. we really want this to be one of the priorities because it's a, there is a difference and I think the county's great, it's progressive and comes and speaks in favor of a lot of bills, but there is a difference between what is a county priority 
um, and what is a um, something that the county is willing to speak in favor of. So that's worth understanding uh, as advocates. Um, and then the question I think that was just asked was, was do I intend to introduce CCE again? And I, I actually am looking to the county right now to see if the county is interested in, um, I think the county is making some really good, hard decisions, having some good conversations internally and, and maybe with these um, stakeholder groups as well as with, uh, um, with the uh, consultants. And um, I think if the county decides that it's a priority for them, um, I would probably reintroduce it. I think if the county thinks probably they're not likely to move forward with a CCE anyways, um, I probably wouldn't introduce it because it's a, it's a pretty major fight and you kind of end up having to give up a lot of other things for it. And if we're not sure that there's some um, jurisdiction that is likely to move forward with it, Montgomery County would be the most likely. If there's not a jurisdiction likely to move forward, it may not be worth putting our energy behind it. Um, as opposed to other things. So I think right now it's really, um, uh, and, I, and I, I wanna be really clear, I say this with like an incredible amount of respect for Adriana, for Adam, for the leadership, for the folks working on this. Um, I think they're being very thoughtful about what it is they wanna put their effort into. Um, and I wanna um, support that in the General Assembly and I wanna kind of be, be working in, in concert with them. And so um, I think it's, uh, it's really, the, the decision has to come from the county now of how much do they want a CCE. And then I'll, if they think that they want to pursue it, then I'll do everything I can to, to get it through in the General Assembly. I'd like to jump in with a just yeah, go ahead, Diana. Here. Um, and that is if we are going to effectively advocate for things now, it'd be really helpful if we could have a work group get together so that we have um, a solid idea about what people are uh, plan to uh, introduce. So it, I think that would pull you in, Lorig, and Adriana and other people in the county executive branch so that we, if we're going to advocate uh, for something, we need to know what it's possible for us to advocate for. Was that clear? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I, and I don't want to tell you what your strategy ought to be. I think that you could start advocating now that the county had, if, if we assume that the county and Amy might be able to jump in on this, but if we assume that the county is, wants the strategy of four or five top priorities and then a number of other things that they'll get behind, um, you could start now saying, we think that one of those four or five top priorities ought to be energy climate related. Because um, last year, I, I don't think they were, but, well, transportation. So if you think it should be something other, in addition to transportation, um, I guess I would Yeah, say. transportation didn't necessarily uh, equate to clean energy. Right. So, um, so anyways, I don't know how far you want to get into the strategy issue, but I think that, Diana, you could start talking to the county now about saying you want to make sure at least one of those priorities is an energy-related bill. Um, and then, um, oh, is someone going to ask me to talk about MOPR? You know that that'll be all night. Um, uh, sorry, I was just checking the chat. Um, but I, so I think you could ask for, you could, you could ask for that priority in an energy area. Now you could start advocating for that even, um, uh, even before, uh, you know what the specifics are. Cause what I'm hearing Adriana say is that they're still figuring out what the specifics of the plan are. Um, but you could be working right now to say that one of the priorities in Annapolis ought to be. Uh, an energy bill. Adriana, do you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, um, Laura is right. We're still very much in the explore, exploration and learning stage. Um, we don't have um, uh, kind of a, a set of um, uh, ready, uh, ready to go proposals that we're ready to pitch. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the county um, certainly supported CC in the past. And thank you, Laura, for your leadership and you know, hard work on that. Um, I don't see um, any significant change in our support, uh, but we, we do want to explore you know, other ideas. Uh, this field is always evolving and changing. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on uh, in other parts of the country, and we uh, are looking actively at, you know, what are some of the um, innovative things being done in other cities and you know, elsewhere um, to see if there's some um, uh, things that could be applicable here too. Um, so, um, you know, it's um, very much a kind of open state of play in terms of um, 
um, you know, these ideas. And, and we also realized that not everything is going to be ready to go for, you know, for this coming session. Um, some ideas kind of really take time to, to get formed. Um, one um, thing that I think would be very helpful for uh, TPMAC um, um, to uh, assist in relation with this work is um, uh, you, you probably already have many uh, coalitions and, and collaborations with folks around the state. Uh, but if you could help to gauge, um, you know, what are the, uh, the priorities of other um, counties um, uh, relating to clean energy and kind of help share that information with us. And we can kind of try to, to um, kind of get that additional source of information for um, areas that we may be able to build um, um, kind of some widespread support around. So uh, thank you, Adrian. And uh, I'm going to... Uh... Um, maybe put put one of our other participants on on the spot here, uh, if, if you choose to respond. But um, we do have among our participants uh, Don Ashbacher, who is the sustainability coordinator for Frederick County, and of course the the uh, the politics of Frederick are very different than Montgomery. Um, but Don, do you want to um, do you want to say anything from the perspective of uh, Frederick County and, and sustainability and kind of uh, how, how you're hearing this discussion with, with that lens on. Hi, I, I guess I will speak cautiously. I think it's always good to think regionally on these topics and also statewide. And Frederick County is in a different state of the conversation. I think we're, we're much earlier in the conversation. So I want to just continue to support even being able to have an open dialogue for those who want to bring it forward. Okay, that, that's fair. Yes, I and having talked with you, I understand. I didn't want to put you on a spot, but I but I do want to just acknowledge that uh, um, you know we are trying to and and I know you and Adriana have communicated and just you know to think about how we in Montgomery can be uh, um, reaching out to our, our colleagues, not only in other parts of Montgomery County, but as, as Adriana was saying, in, in other parts of the state and, and not uh, just the, uh, um, the bluest parts of the state. So um, let me go back. There, there, there are a number of uh, questions that you all have asked. Um, I guess let's talk, if, if we could, um, about the, uh, the Laura, at, at the end, you were talking about the whatever stimulus funds or federal uh, money as it is. Certainly some federal funds are coming to Maryland. Um, we talked about this at our April 7th webinar. Um, I don't know if two months later we know anything more about what's available to Maryland um, or how we better um, encourage that that money be spent as, as you called for on uh, green infrastructure and especially focus on the, uh, the low income people and frontline communities who are being uh, super infected by COVID as well as so many other things. Yeah, so what I can tell you is there's a coalition of folks. Um, CCAN is in a leadership position in this conversation. I know a lot of you are connected to them as well. Um, Sierra Club uh, and LCV are involved. Um, and just, just, sorry, just, just for people who are not in, in, in the weeds, uh, um, can you just identify the groups in addition sorry, to their Chesapeake. acronyms? Yeah, sorry, Chesapeake Climate Action Network um, being CCAN. Um, and, and then the conservation a, voters. Yes. League of Sorry, Pens Sorry. yes, League of Pens yes, okay, thank you for checking me. Um, and um, there's a number of others, uh, some clean energy folks, folks who do advocacy around community solar, I, I'm not thinking of all the names of, of everybody in the, in the coalition right now, transportation equity folks. Um, and uh, there's some there's a number of work groups, so I'm I'm involved in some of this, but I, I can't speak to the, the whole package at this point. But I can tell you that the the package that's being put together is sort of along the lines of um, what are some things that could be done um, through regulation right now, um, that being public service commission regulation or any of the state agencies that have regulatory authority. What are the things that could be done there right now? Um, 
that could, uh, you know, with no money at all or with very little money, um, move the needle on creating more jobs in our green, in green, green jobs. Um, and then what are the things that could be changed at a statutory level with money, without money, with a little money, with a lot of money? The idea is to sort of have this tiered um, effort so that whether there's, um, whether we get a lot or a little money from the federal government, um, there's steps that we can take that are about creating jobs and specifically creating jobs in the kind of economy that we know that we need to build. Um, so that's, uh, that's what that effort looks like. I think we don't yet know what a recovery plan is going to look like from the federal government. And I think that we're going to be in recovery for a little while. And so we might have Long while. one recovery. Yeah. Well, geologically, geological time speaking a little while. <laughs> um, we might have one recovery, um, you know, that's uh, not so good, you know, the, the package that comes together in the next few months. And then um, if all goes well in November, we might have a different kind of recovery package that we get in January, February, March. So, um, but one of the things that I would say that, that, uh, that both the state and the county could do, can be doing, is really looking at these questions about, if people remember back in 2009, the way that the federal money came was uh, focused on what we called what was called shovel ready projects and so really looking at what are the projects that can be moved right away so i'm having some of these conversations with state highway administration for example on complete streets and the maryland department of trans um, montgomery county department of transportation and can we, which where are the where are the projects where you could build the bike lanes and the pedestrian lanes and the and have and, and how can we line that up so in our minds we've gotten as far as we can and it's shovel ready so that should money come um, should any infrastructure money come, whether it's because if you remember in 2009, some of it was designated transportation or other things, but a lot of it was like shovel ready infrastructure projects and it was very broad. So if we get similarly broad, broad money, we want to be ready with projects and with a plan to direct it into green jobs, to direct it into complete streets, to direct it into equitable jobs. Um, and so that's, I think, the conversations and the planning that can be happening right now, even before we know what that money is or how much that money is. Okay, that's very helpful. And, and again, by uh, calling out community members who aren't on the agenda, um, we do have with us tonight Cecilia Plant from the uh, Maryland Legislative Coalition. Um, so, Cecilia, do you want to add anything from the, the standpoint of the coalition that we also participate in? and I know you all are, are are much more engaged at the state level than, than we are. Yeah, we're we're thanks, David. Um, we are right now working on um, trying to get the special session safely for our legislators, uh, maybe later in the year, um, to override Hogan's vetoes. Uh, I like the um, idea, Laurie, of. Um, Larig of going and um, trying to deal with Hogan in terms of the money that he is holding um, and see if we can't start a letter writing campaign in that respect. Um, but we are, uh, we are pushing on every front that we can with Hogan, um, trying to get him to understand that yes, we are watching. We know that he's holding money. We know he's holding jobs up right now, job creation um, in a variety of, of areas. Um, so any suggestions, Lori, that you have that would make us more um, effective uh, would be great. Uh, we're also uh, working on a scorecard for Hogan uh, in terms of all the legislation, I need to see your smile, uh, in terms of all the legislation that he is vetoing, not just this year, but we wanna go back and show, I mean, the man is a veto machine um, and see, uh, so that people start seeing how much legislation that we fight so hard for gets killed at the veto pen at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, any other suggestions that you have that would help make us a little more effective um, we are raring to go, so. Great, thank you. And, and Cecilia, let, let me actually go, go backwards. I, I called on you for your priorities. Could you also, because not everybody on the call is uh, um, up to speed on the Maryland Legislative Coalition, so could you just tell us who, who the coalition is and, and, uh, and your, 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 your role in this niche of organizations or niche in this ecosystem of organizations? 
Okay. Um, the Maryland Legislative Coalition is a is a coalition of I hate to say that twice, but That's it's okay. a coalition of um, grassroots groups and individuals uh, from across the state. So you know, if you're looking at groups, um, all the Indivisibles, the Our Revolutions, the Progressive Marylands, the Huddles, the Together We Wills, um, Tacoma Park Mobilization, you know, any of the groups that are um, that are that are interested in state level legislation um, that moves the needle for Maryland. You know, I hate to use the word progressive because it's got a lot of connotations in this day and age, but essentially anything that makes us better and stronger, um, not just on the environmental front, although we are all um, very, there's a lot, a lot of environmentalists in our groups, um, but uh, gun control, schools, better schools, better health care, um, social justice, criminal justice, um, you know, we have a very large tent. Um, and what we do is we watch the state legislation very carefully. Um, we work with uh, legislators such as Laurie, who is awesome. Uh, and, um, and we work with partner groups, uh, which are paid lobbyists. So uh, the, the Sierra Clubs, the League of Conservation Voters, the uh, Chesapeake Climate Action uh, Network, um, and, and other groups, NAACP, ACLU, CASA, um, you know, Moms Demand uh, Action for Gun Control, you know, all of those different groups, healthcare groups, education groups, and we figure out what is the best legislation that's gonna happen each year. And we, we tell people about it. We tell people what's happening, what legislation to support, how to support it, who do you call, who do you write, when is testimony due on a bill. Um, so we are an information machine, if you wanna think of it that way. We consolidate a lot of information and we give it back. Um, and, and we don't ask anything of our members. So if you aren't a member, be a member. Um, we don't ask anything other than people to advocate for the stuff that they think is important. We don't make people advocate for everything that we advocate for. So if you, know, you are very strong on the environmental side and you don't have the time and the wherewithal to deal with social justice stuff, we're not gonna make you. We just wanna give you information and make it easy for you to advocate. And that's, um, that's what we do. So our website is mdlegislative.com. And there's a join us button and you'll get on our newsletter. You'll, you'll start seeing that. Uh, our scorecards are up. Uh, so scorecards for this session and last session. I didn't put the previous ones up there, but that will have to happen. Um, when we get the Hogan scorecard, we'll have that one up there as well. Um, and we just have a lot of really good information for people, but you'll want to see our newsletter and start knowing what's happening in Maryland in terms of legislation. Great. Th thank you, Cecilia. And I, and I know we've got other community groups that are members of the coalition who are represented on the call. I, I want to switch a little bit now to a specific topic that several people have brought up and let's see if we can do this without being too technical but there's several questions about net metering so uh, um, Adriana Laura who wants to uh, talk about net metering um, what what it is why it's important and uh, what the uh, the issues and challenges are so Adriana unmuted first so go ahead I can take a stab at a very lay lay person's um, which should be good. <laughs> for, for <many> <laughs> so um, net metering basically allows the um, electricity that's generated from the solar panels um, to be sold back into the grid at the net meter uh, rate, which is higher than the wholesale uh, rate. So if um, a solar installation is able to be net metered, it makes the financing work out much better. Um, the state has two kinds of caps uh, on net metering. Uh, one is a per project cap, uh, which I think is two megawatts uh, cap. So any project that's larger than two megawatts cannot be net metered. 
uh, and there is also a, a state statewide project total cap um, uh, or statewide cap on all projects of 1,500 megawatts. Um, so uh, once the total uh, number of solar installations in the state um, surpasses that amount, uh, then any future solar installations beyond that 1,500 megawatts uh, will not be eligible for net metering. I believe we're around the halfway mark uh, to that statewide cap. Um, and we um, have advocated um, you know, at the state level for that um, cap to be lifted. Great, and, and Laura, do you wanna jump in in terms of the, the policy issues that, uh, that Adriana just introduced us to? Yeah, no, I think that's all right. And I, the only thing I would say is that um, it is the, the county has, uh, um, I think has advocated in a sort of broad opportunities for giving input advocacy. I don't think there's been a bill at least there hasn't been a bill in the last two years. There wasn't this session and there wasn't last session to increase that cap. So um, it's true, I think the state's been speaking out about the issue, but I don't think we've actually formally considered a bill in the General Assembly. So um, I'm cautiously hopeful. I talked a little bit to, uh, to Adriana about this the other day. There, there could actually be a really interesting coalition of folks that might support that. There's a lot of people who are concerned about utility scale solar who um, in, in fact, in, in um, redder counties um, who want to see more distributed generation. There's a lot of folks who are doing advocacy work for low income folks around community solar who would want to see more community solar installations. There's folks who are concerned about farmland and would want to see more distributed generation. So there, there's an interesting set of people who want to promote more distributed generation distributed being the smaller solar projects as opposed to the utility scale solar projects, which are bigger than the two megawatts. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I actually think, uh, you know, if, if you put together the right coalition, we, we might be able to get that through specifically the, the idea of increasing the cap from 1500 to something above that. The math to make rooftop solar and community solar viable be really, really tough without net metering. So if you hit that 1500 cap, it would be hard to go much over that if you don't have if you don't have net metering, but I, I think it's possible. So it's one of the things that if the county made a decision that that that, that would be a priority. I think we could we could work with folks and I think we could get that through. And and the opposition is from whom? Well, the utilities. Okay. Um, and um, you know the fossil fuel industry with uh well we, we we don't know exactly i mean i i've heard utilities speak out against it i think the fossil fuel industry of course quietly or or loudly we're you know we'll, we'll speak out against it i think it's worth noting that so right now uh nero which is the new england ratepayers association which is a ratepayers association my hands are in quotes if folks can't mm -hmm. see the video um that's funded by fossil fuel interests that, that just recently brought a complaint to FERC asking FERC to regulate rooftop solar as wholesale electricity, which would ultimately override state's ability to do net metering policies at the state level. Um, so you could see that as an example of what the fossil fuel industry is doing kind of at all levels to, to stop our ability to do that. So I suspect that they would be working on it some kind of a way in the state. Um, but I think, um, so yeah, I mean, those would be the obvious ones and I'm sure there'd be others too, but that's, that's kind of the most immediate one. And, and so the, the FERC threat, I mean, the FERC has already uh, done some nasty things in terms of uh, ability to, for, for renewables in, in this region. So, um, I mean, is, is there a process that FERC actually uh, responds to public comments? Yeah, it's called getting a new president and getting rid of the okay. people on FERC. That's, that's how they respond. Okay, and, and FERC being the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission. So, okay, so, so that, that's a, a real threat. It is a real threat, yeah. I mean, it's worth making public comments. A number of us signed on to, we, we've done filings with them on MOPR. We have a number of signed a letter on on the NERA um, net, net metering, but that's more just to be taking a public position, not because FERC actually cares what state legislators think about our ability to have clean energy policy. 
Okay, thanks. Let, let's turn back to, to the, the county. Um, Adriana, you mentioned, and uh, I think, Lord, you also mentioned briefly about the, the Dickerson um, um, incinerator being closed down, and a number of well, questions have come up. I'm sorry, the cold. Both plant. of them are there. Incinerator is not being closed down right now. Okay, the coal okay plant sorry. Down. Coal plant being closed down. And so there are um, several questions that have come up in terms of what are the potentials of using the site, using the equipment, and uh, some of the technologies for generating renewables. Yeah, it's something that we've just started looking at, um, uh, looking at the ownership of that site. Uh, it looks like um, part of the site is owned by Genon and part of it is owned by Pepco for um, their transmission lines. Um, um, we are interested in um, uh, having some conversations with Pepco about the possibility of using some space under transmission lines, not, not only there, but just in general, they have about 1,400 acres um, in the county of space under the transition lines that would be at least theoretically available for solar. Um, but from, from um, our initial research, it looks like there's nowhere, at least in the east coast of the U.S., where um, solar has been installed under utilities transmission line. So if we're able to get that done, uh, we would be the first. Um, but we are we're having some initial uh, conversations um, with Pepco on this issue um, next, well, this month in about a week or so. Okay. Um, and then more specifically related to that location, um, I think that we would have to look at, you know, shading issues, um, you know, and, and, and see what, what, you know, because we don't want to cut down any trees for solar um, and, you know, see what opportunities there may be for some, you know, public private partnerships. Um, because if we are able to partner with the private sector, there are tax credits that they can get that uh, reduce the cost of the installation. So, so, so your, your sense, uh, Adriana, is that the key is going to be um, working with Pepco on the part of the, uh, um, the, the site that, that they are managing and control owning themselves. Right. And so for, for, for us, that's really at this point, uh, kind of stay tuned and, and, and you'll let us know if there are opportunities. Yeah, stay tuned. Or also, if you are able to find any examples from anywhere in the U.S. where okay. someone has managed to partner with a utility to install solar under their transmission line, please let us know. We'd love to learn of any examples um, that, are, that may be out there. Okay, so there's, there's a challenge for us. Thank you. And I think, you know, I think that if, um, if we, I also think that if, if we, we've talked a little bit about this, if, if we could get there, um, we've seen European models of solar under transmission lines. I think if we could get a solar developer to do some math and demonstrate that it could work, um, we could also require through legislation that the utilities work with counties to build that out. Mm -hmm. um, now it's, you know, some of you have been involved in going to legislation that the utilities oppose, and it's 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 a tough it's a tough effort. But um, but it is a possibility um, if if we had reason to believe that the that the the project itself would pencil out. And so I think that's a that's just another take if if they're not interested in working on it. I just mentioned one other thing, which is Genon um, doesn't own any renewables. They're a national company, and they have all of it is coal and. Um, it's all coal and uh, gas fire power plants. They do have gas fire power plants in Dickerson that they are not closing. Those are staying staying open. Um, but it but it uh, you know, we were looking at one point about like could Genon shift to doing some renewables there, um, and possibly although their portfolio is is all fossil fuel. I think they may have one or two nuclear, but um, I'm fairly certain it's all fossil fuel. So they don't they don't really even have the. Uh the technical abilities necessarily within their companies. They could learn, I suppose. Yeah. They could or, or they it. could partner. They could sell yeah. it to another developer. Um, I don't have relationships really with them. I'm not sure, Adriana, if the county is, is talking to them about the possibility of doing something else with the part of it that they own. Okay. Adriana, you're muted. There you go. Um, no, we have not engaged with Genon yet. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I know you've got a lot on your plate just trying to get the consultant going. Let, let me, um, before we let you go in a moment here, um, ask Adriana just a couple other specific county things. Um, Mark, uh, at the uh, meeting in uh, February, uh, seems like years ago, when we were actually able to get together in person for the uh, um, town hall on the uh, working group recommendations, Mark talked about uh, electric school buses and uh, using tax credits to uh, um, for um, electrifying the school buses so that's one and then I guess generally any other any other progress on uh, community solar in the county sure um, so my understanding is that the communication continues um, between MCPS um, and the the private entity that is interested in partnering with them um, to make um, electric buses pencil out uh, for MCPS. Uh, we have a, a staff member, our, our fleet manager from the Department of General Services that has been helping to coordinate those conversations and make sure that they, they keep going. And um, when I checked in with him about a month ago on this, he said that they were still meeting and still that was still progressing. Um, and then what was the, the second part of your question? Just sort of a general question about um, new community solar in the county. I believe there's there's a project that's uh, being developed now with um, grid alternatives. Is is it uh, in in East County? I can't remember what. Um, the project that I'm aware of um, that the county is um, involved with is the Oaks landfill um, site, uh, community solar. That's a closed landfill, um, you know, brownfield site that is going to be repurposed um, with solar panels. Uh, it's going to have a total of six megawatts of solar. Uh, two megawatts will be used um, for county facility use and the remaining four megawatts will be used for low and moderate income residents through a um, subscription management um, uh, 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 mechanism. Um, and that is progressing. And I believe that that project should be wrapping up by the end of the calendar year. When you say wrapping up, Meaning like solar panels installed by the end so, of the so calendar. actually physically right. awesome. Okay. All right. Well, we've we've taken uh, you guys have been been wonderful. We've taken a, a lot of your evening here. Um, Lori, I, I know there, there there is one technical question about uh, modeling tools, but I, I think we're going to um, that that may be a little bit too detailed uh, for this audience, but um, Lori, who's been monitoring monitoring the chat, uh, are there is there anything that I missed uh, before we we let our uh, our guests go on to the rest of their lives? Yeah, <laughs> or at least. Um, we... No, I don't think there's anything that we've asked you a lot of questions, and I don't, I'm not sure we've missed anything. But thank you for such a rich discussion. It's really been so informative and. It's really going to help us think through our priorities and and where we we work. And I'm delighted that so many other people are on the on the um, the meeting, the Zoom tonight, because um, we'll be working with other groups as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, this this has been great, uh, and and you two are are fabulous, and we're so proud to uh, have you as uh, part of our community here in Montgomery County and in Maryland. Thank you all thank you. for all your great advocacy. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. And 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 um, you are you and and others on the call are, are welcome to uh, to stay if if you want for the rest of the agenda. So, Diana or, or Lori, do you want to just kind of let us know where we are on the agenda and what's coming up next for people who are deciding whether to uh, um, get Stick off around. or, or on? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, really, just two other things we were going to talk about this evening. Um, uh, several of us have been in conversation about reinvigorating grassroots uh, climate communication coordination. Um, so we're going to talk about that and bring everybody up to speed on, on what we've been working on. And then, um, David, I think you might have a brief update on the Tacoma Park Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. So no, those I are may, really I the may call on one of our, our guests if uh, she doesn't leave uh, <laughs> the call. <Okay. laughs> She's smiling at me, so hopefully she'll stay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Why don't you talk about? Because actually, I was going to ask you when, in terms, because yeah, um, we don't. Not everybody knows about the the grant that TP Mech has and the work we're doing. So why don't you jump into that? Because 
I think that will be of interest to people beyond just the Tacoma Park community. Yeah, so um, I don't know if she's still on. Uh, Lily Hawkins from Food and Water Watch was on, may still be on. Um, so I, I want to give a, a particular shout out to her. Um, this is a grant that we got from Food and Water Watch to um, uh, to Tacoma Park Mobilization, $500, um, with the purpose of putting it towards our efforts to reinvigorate the um, coalition of grassroots groups working on climate. Um, two years ago it was the Maryland Leads on Climate Coalition. And so uh, some of the folks on the call have been, were part of that in 2018. Um, we've been working really closely just as we've started to kick this off um, with some really terrific expertise and help from Cecilia Plant um, with the Maryland Legislative Coalition. So we'll, we'll rather than create something new, um, I think we'll really work with uh, Cecilia and that coalition to strengthen communication, um, have strategies hopefully broaden the folks that we work with across the straight state and um, also look at ways in which we in individual counties can work with our county leadership um, as well as our state leadership to be as organized as possible on what what bills we want to push and then um, hopefully just be an effective force <laughs> when when uh, at the start of the legislation legislator legislature um, so I'll just um, ask Diana or Paula, um, who have been part of those conversations, if they want to add anything. Both on mute. Anyway, so does anyone have any questions about it? This is really just, we're just at the very beginning um, doing some strategizing and um, would welcome, you know, other, other folks to be working with us. Olivia raised her hand. Um, yeah, there is a Maryland Climate Coalition, which yes. is more of a professional groups and lobbying. How is this going to relate to that? Dan Fermansky co uh, coordinates that? Well, we are part of the Maryland Climate Coalition. So um, the, you know, I don't know that we've talked everything through thoroughly. So it's all a matter of, you know, final direction has an, is an issue about uh, where this all goes. But the whole idea is to strengthen our, our voice and our communication. So, and I will just give a little bit of an example from last year that um, the Maryland Climate Coalition had as a priority um, community choice energy. And a number of us, uh, a number of us grassroots organizations had as a priority community choice energy. But we didn't necessarily know what all of the grassroots organizations were doing. Um, uh, I think in the call that we had with Cecilia, we learned that there were a number of Eastern Shore groups that had community choice energy as a priority. And um, I think Lori and I were both unaware that it was, you know, that there were groups, other groups on the Eastern Shore that had it as a priority. So the idea is just to, um, to have very good communication on priorities. And additionally, hopefully, um, that we um, as a group, um, as, a, as a coalition, um, really prioritize uh, one or two or three pieces of legislation that we all fight hard for and coordinate on. I mean, MCC set as priorities a number of pieces of legislation um, and a number of areas for legislation. As the legislative process went on, there wasn't actually um, legislation that was introduced that related to those priorities, or if there was legislation, there weren't actually any particular groups that were fighting for those pieces of legislation. 
And um, because there were so many pieces of legislation that MCC was um, had as a priority, it, they ended up um, being in competition with each other to some extent. And so we would really like to make it be that we are not in competition with um, multiple groups, that we are really strengthening the chance for climate legislation to pass. And that we agree as a group what we think um, those pieces of climate legislation should be. And, and we think also that we can coordinate tactically, um, you know, just as we had a really great conversation about how we can work with our county to get legislative priorities. If we're working in grass with grassroots groups in other counties and they are doing similar things, that, that positions us to have, um, you know, an even stronger, um, stronger coalition among our elected officials as well at the county level when we go to the legislature, not just working with our, our delegates. So, you know, mulling over s some different tactics which we as grassroots groups think that we can add to the mix of tools as we all are advocating for, you know, key pieces of legislation. And I'd like to add to that grassroots, we have as grassroots organizations tools that um, the big climate groups don't have, I mean, for one thing, um, you know, we're concentrated in areas and we have relationships with, you know, with our county councils. Um, um, and oh, something, and I keep going back to CCE because that was our, that was our big piece that, that TP Met did this year and a number of us did. But um, something that would have uh, made that easier to happen is if um, counties, if grassroots organizations across the state had pushed their counties to declare climate emergencies and had pushed their counties to, um, to look at CCE as a way to address uh, their uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals. So as grassroots organizations, we can push for, you know, a general goal um, without even knowing um, what particular pieces of legislation might be upcoming of pushing our counties declare, to declare climate um, emergencies and then use that as a framework for um, pushing particular pieces of legislation when we reach a consensus as to what particular pieces of legislation we should all be pushing for. And Diana, I hope you don't mind me jumping in as well. Um, the, the Climate Coalition is a very, very big coalition. Uh, they've got some, some very well-funded groups that are part of it. Um, last year, there were a lot of environmental bills that came out that the coalition was supporting. Um, but what happened is uh, CCAN would support uh, their bill and Sierra Club supported their bill and, and LCV supported theirs and you know everybody had a bill that they were pushing and honestly truly if if I was a legislator looking at all of this coming at me with you know 20 different high priority bills I wouldn't know what to do you know you've got a lot you, you got a lot to think about, not just with environmental bills, but with the number of bills that they see. It's just completely overwhelming. Um, and I joined the Climate Coalition last year, and I was very frustrated with that. Uh, there were some of the groups that are part of our coalition were part of the Climate Coalition, but not very many, actually. Um, it was more of the paid lobbyists, you know, that were driving this thing. Um, and uh, I've joined the steering committee for that. And, and one of the things I'm pushing them for is to stop coming up with so many bills to try and put their eggs in smaller baskets to see if they can get everybody behind something. But I don't know if that will happen. We may have, again, what we've had every year, which is a plethora of crazy bills, um, all of them good, 
most of them good, I would say. Um, many of them game changing, but way too many for the legislature to dis to digest and get through. So the idea behind this is to get the grassroots people who are really the ones that I think can change the direction of legislation if we all put our voices together to get behind, as, as Diana said, one or two bills that everybody is behind. And then, you know, if, if you're into electrification of vehicles, you can, you can take that on if your group is into that and somebody else can do CCEs if that's important to them. But at least everybody would be focused on one or two bills and we wouldn't be splitting all of our efforts. So more on this, as I said, we're, we're just at the beginning. Um, you know, we, we have to kind of figure out how to have this conversation, but right now we're, we're really in the information gathering stage, um, you know, having a very sort of Montgomery County centric conversation right now, just to see what, where our county's going, how we can be supportive legislatively here in Montgomery County, but then also looking for where um, other counties are and, and where we might be able to coalesce. So it's sort of like a work with everybody, but, but be a lot more strategic and tactical. And, and, you know, as Cecilia is good at saying, you know, how do we really maximize the use of our power? E pluribus unum. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Frederick and Howard County here. We do. And, and maybe and, others. And MPG as well. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so um, I don't know that there's a whole lot more to say on this. We're, as I said, we're just at the beginning, but um, really hoping to make the best use of the summertime since getting an early start, you know, sort of figuring things out, working with our counties and our, our delegation early, working with other counties and, and other groups kind of the, the earlier the start we get, I think the better it will position us. And then, then you know, we're also really trying to be sensitive to how COVID-19 has changed the landscape, either in terms of more difficult challenges or maybe some opportunities about how we, we come back differently. Um, you know, certainly as David said, putting a much, um, you know, really intentional lens of, of health and equity and environmental justice on the sorts of things we choose to work on. Which is completely legitimate. One, one more thing, last summer, uh, do the most good. Um, we had in-person meetings and Cecilia attended a number of them representing um, Maryland, um, I don't know, I, I legislative lost your group. Coalition. <laughs> legislative coalition. Uh, but we set up meetings with um, almost all, there were like three members of the Maryland Montgomery County delegation that we never could get meetings with. Uh, but we had sit down meetings with, like I said, virtually all of the members of the Montgomery County delegation, asking them for heads up on what their bills, what their priorities would be for the upcoming session. You know, a lot of those got derailed then. Um, so that we would have a heads up and we could circulate those through our, you know, through the large list of folks who get, you know, we have 2,000 people who get the bi-weekly, the every other week, do the most good action update so that we could let them know, you know, we're willing, these are things we want to work with you on. So if that's the kind of thing you're um, working towards, then do the, you know, I'm the environment lead for do the most good. So we'll certainly be on board with that. I was just, and, and we're not a formal member of the Maryland Climate Coalition because it's all paid and, and, you know, everything. And a lot of it was, um, you know, two in the weeds for, for what our members were looking for. Um, but a cooperation across grassroots groups across the county and, you know, in Frederick PG and Howard County would, and, and you know, Cecilia's groups from, you know, many other counties would be a great idea.
Great. Well, we look forward to working with you, Olivia. That'd be terrific. Um, just one, one um, plug, um, and then I gotta get off because we haven't had dinner yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are interested in more partisan work on your own, not from TPMAC, uh, Do the Most Good has um, virtual letter writing parties uh, for the vote forward letter writing uh, to voters all over the country to encourage them to get out the vote. The letters are, if you go to voteforward.org, um, you can see what that's all about and decide if you want to do that. Um, we're also supporting uh, candidates for the Pennsylvania State House to try and give them a boost. And we'll be uh, supporting candidates for the North Carolina State House shortly. So if in your, not your TP Mac, but if you're interested in partisan work and any of those things, uh, you can go to the Do the Most Good website and sign up. Thank I co-host on Thursday afternoons our letter writing parties. And starting next Monday, we'll have Monday evenings as well. And I'll co-host those. Thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. OK. Bye, everyone. Thank you bye for bye. inviting me, David. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to, Diana, to, Diana. to see you at least in this fashion. <laughs> yeah, good to, good to see folks I haven't seen since uh, last fall. So bye. Bye, Olivia. Thanks for bye. joining us. Um, so before we, we close out, and we will end on time at 9, um, uh, any, any quick update, David, from um, the city on the um, Tacoma Park Sustainability and Climate Action Plan? I'm, I'm actually oh, going to- And Cindy as well. I'm, I'm going to yield to our, our uh, wonderful uh, climate and clean energy leader on our city council, uh, um, Cindy Dybala, who uh, represents Ward 2 of Tacoma Park. Well, thank you. Very quickly, just uh, four things. Um, so speaking of adv advocacy and coordination, so uh, those of you who live in Tacoma Park know already that the city is able to and does um, co advocate for specific county policies and state legislation. And like what you heard from uh, Adriana, the city has a process where over the summer into the fall, legislative priorities are identified. And then in the winter, that pile of bills, we plow through and we find the ones that we as a city are gonna support. Um, last year, climate and CCE in particular was a priority. Again, same distinction, priority versus bills we support. So uh, this is a good time to start thinking about what you want your city to prioritize in terms of legislation. And um, TP Mac will surely let you know when the city has on its, city council has on its agenda, the priorities for the next state legislative session. It won't be this month, it may be next month. Um, so that's the first thing. As far as the, um, if, you're not from, if you're not from Tacoma Park, you may not know that in March, the city council passed a fairly ambitious uh, climate set of climate, climate strategies, priority strategies, and asked that they be developed into implementations that the city council could take. So um, our city council, uh, our city sustainability program, um, like everybody else, got a little behind because of COVID and remote working at home. So the first thing that, that she's been doing is reorienting some of the existing energy efficiency programs to dovetail with the efforts that the city is making in um, multifamily housing to protect people because of COVID. So dealing with what can you do outdoors? What can you do in your apartment that somebody can hand you? What can you do when the, the landlord is sending people into the building already? What can you send with them? that's energy efficiency and not only about COVID. So she's been working on that, um, which means she hasn't been working as much on the part that she kind of uh, like, same kind of thing that Adriana was talking about. If you're, if you're, our next step was 
outreach to those uh, groups that are the most difficult to engage on climate. So literally it was like two weeks before the shutdown, we passed this and directed her to do that. And not surprisingly, that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, Adriana and some other folks have had very creative ideas about how to move forward with working with those groups. Um, and so I hope that we can, I hope that we can pick that up and not just delay it indefinitely till we can have in-person meetings. Um, but that is, that was the next step and that is the challenge. The third part is to rethink some of the implementation of the things that we had planned for implementation of the priority strategies. So um, if you're doing home energy audits, is this, do you, want, do you want to start with single family or maybe now you want to start with multifamily? So we're, we're looking at um, different ways to regroup on that. And um, I think for the, for the group here, the message is um, speak to your city council members early and often about climate, uh, but also um, the challenge here is to connect the dots, to connect the dots to health and, to health and to equity, um, which are the two big challenges that we are, that are just staring us in the face right now and that we really need to, to, um, to deal with. So that, in a nutshell, that's what I have to say and people can contact me offline if you wanna hear more. Thank you. And, and Cindy, do you wanna just briefly say in terms of the budget uh, where, oh. where things came with that? Um, so the the sustainability budget. So the city council did cut the city budget, um, including personnel, um, by quite a bit. And the sustainability budget and the uh, it remained intact except for um, I think it was forty thousand dollars that had been allocated to be spent on this in person outreach to groups that are difficult to reach um, in normal times. Um, and across the board, anything that had to do with large scale education, big group outreach, et cetera, got cut. No, no, no monster bash. <laughs> right. No, right. The July parade, no outreach on climate change right now. So big, big group outreach. So that's where we were with the budget. So I, I actually thought that was pretty good, including an intern to help Gina. So, so the intern to to help with the sustainability budget that the uh, Mobilization Commi Environment Committee weighed in on that, that was kept. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yes. That okay. Was All right. Laurie, we're uh, <laughs> right at- I think, at, I think at, we're at time. At the mark here. <laughs> we're right at, at nine o'clock on the nose. So um, uh, we'll close this out. Um, we're planning to Zoom again, uh, July 7th. Hopefully that works for folks. I, I put it on the agenda as tentative. Um, so we'll structure some time to really talk through um, where our group has energy and where we think there's some, some really great places to work over the next uh, six to 12 months as we did last summer. Um, so come with your ideas. Um, uh, we look forward to, to talking at that meeting and, and also on the agenda, there's a note about um, if you want to comment on the uh, New England Ratepayers Association petition to FERC on net metering. Um, I think I put some links in there. The comment period ends June 15th, so there's still um, time to comment on that. So um, thank you all. Uh, great meeting. We, we really uh, were so fortunate to have such great speakers and, and terrific participation. So yep. um, thank you all. And thank you for uh, doing the technical part, Diana. I'm impressed. Yep. So, so <laughs> yeah. till, till well, we have seven... half of the conversation uh, recorded. No, you get most of it. Yeah. So till 7-7-2020 seven, seven, at 7. Oh, man. OK. okay. <laughs> so if, if anybody wants to be uh, playing the numbers, there, there you go. OK. Thanks, thank, David. thank you Thanks, all. Lori, yeah. Thanks, Cindy. David. Thanks. Right, stay safe, everybody. everybody. Stay safe. Yes, you too.